Special thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. Hello guys, Winston here. As some of you know, last year I had optimistically hoped to be able to travel around the west coast with a skeletonized Shaboko named Samwise to do some potential collaborations. But that plan went out the window faster than you can say COVID-19, and Sam has been collecting dust on the bottom shelf of my CNC enclosure. Since it really pained me to see that machine idle, I decided to turn Sam into something of an art project. These skeletonized rails look cool on their own, but I think we all know to have them really live up to their potential, I just had to install LEDs on the machine. I know a handful of people have tried the typical slap a strip of white LED strips under the gantry thing, but the positioning of the rails relative to the spindle really makes that less than ideal for actually illuminating where you're cutting, and it really wouldn't make the Skeloco look any more special. RGB LEDs, like those you would buy with a cheap infrared remote to control colors, are a little cooler, and I will admit a CNC with party mode sounds pretty great, but as is, they're still functionally useless. I would have to be really bored to want to dynamically change the lighting colors for filming purposes. In thinking about my vision for this machine, I realized I needed to look to something I already admired for inspiration, Daytron. Daytron's M8 cube and ML cube CNCs sport status lights built into the gantry that change colors based on whether the machine is idle, blue, in active motion, green, or in an error state, red. It's a subtle thing that looks way cooler than your typical stack light and way more befitting of a CNC from the future. So that begs the question, how can we recreate that on the Shaboko with limited access to the inputs and outputs that Gerbil affords us? Let's take inventory of what we have to work with on the electronic side. The presence of power on the Shaboko's control board should indicate to us that the machine is on and therefore the LEDs should also be on. In the absence of any other inputs, we can default to illuminating the blue channel of the RGB strip. If a spindle on command is received, a PWM signal will be generated by the controller. Ideally, there would be two separate signals controlling the spindle, a steady enable signal from pin D13 to energize the spindle, and a speed control signal on the PWM pin. But the D13 pin is disabled by default on the Gerbil build that Carbide3D loads onto the boards, so I'll have to settle for reading just the PWM pin to decide if I want to illuminate green or not. Since the default max RPM value programmed into Carbide3D's Gerbil builds is 1000 RPM, any spindle command in G-code exceeding this threshold, which is basically all of them if your speeds and feeds data isn't garbage, will trigger a 100% duty cycle PWM signal saturated at 5 volts. The trickiest part of this whole build is picking up the presence of a homing switch or probe activation. Gerbil, by default, reads normally open switches. When a homing switch is triggered, it closes a circuit and basically shorts a 5 volt pin to ground. You can't just simply tap into all of the X, Y, and Z probe pins and tie them together into one signal, because if one of them shorts, the controller will think that all of them shorted. We need to tap into each signal separately and keep them isolated. Now, the smart thing to do would probably be to just throw all these signals into the I.O. pins of an Arduino or something, and that would be able to read the voltage across several pins without affecting the readings themselves or letting the signals bleed across different pins. But I preferred building a custom circuit to do this because, one, basic circuit components are dirt cheap. The build of materials for this was only a couple dollars. Two, these relatively dumb circuits are damn good unitaskers and will sort out the necessary LED logic from the microsecond you turn on power every single time. Three, I'm a masochist. I took a digital circuits class in my sophomore year of undergrad. Not that that makes me qualified to do this sort of thing, but that class molded my brain into perceiving these kinds of problems in the framework of simple logic and state machines. This is my hammer, and every electronics challenge is a nail. And, number four, this gives me an excuse to try milling a circuit board on the Shapeoko. Before we get to the fun CNC stuff though, let me go over how my circuit was planned out. I'll work my way backwards from the LEDs. Everything here revolves around three transistors that control the R, G, and B channels of my LED strips. For those of you that don't know, a transistor is basically a switch that only allows current to flow across it when a signal is applied to the control input called the base. The collector and emitter legs of the transistor go in series with a load to act as sort of a electron toll booth. So my LEDs will only have current flowing through them if the corresponding transistor has voltage and therefore current applied to its base. For the red LED channel, I want the transistor to activate if any or all of my limit switches are triggered. By default, each switch has 5 volts across it. If I want to tap into these pins, I'll have a high reading. That's not what I want, because if I combine them logically, it'll cause the red LEDs to basically always be on. 
If no limit switches are triggered, I actually want the red transistor to see a low or zero volt reading. To do this, I can pass the signals that I siphon off my limit switches through an inverter which flips the reading. 0 volts becomes 5 volts and 5 volts becomes 0. I'm using a 74LS04 hex inverter for this which can flip up to 6 signals. To group these signals together so that if X, Y, Z or a probe is triggered, a single unified high signal is produced, I need to route these inputs through an OR gate, specifically a quad OR chip like the SN74LS32. This chip is designed so that two inputs are compared and the logical output is produced on the third pin. There are, you guessed it, four sets of these trios on this 14-pin IC. X and Y signals go into one pair of inputs, Z and probe go into another. The outputs of these are funneled into a third OR group. Now, if any homing switch or probe triggers, I'll get a high signal out of that OR gate. This is what will control the red channel. Now, for the green channel, we basically need two criteria to be fulfilled. One, no switches are triggered, so red is off. And two, the spindle PWM pin is reading high. If I invert the control signal for the red channel and mix that with the PWM signal through an AND gate, that will give me a high signal when the spindle is on and there are no interruptions from any switches. The AND gate I'm using is a 74HCT08. For the blue channel, I want that transistor to again be powered when there are no switches tripped, but this time also no spindle PWM signal. So same as green, but with that PWM input run through an inverter. This is pretty straightforward to breadboard, but the real test for me was making sure that I wouldn't alter the function of the control board by siphoning off a couple milliamps here and there. So, with my small scale breadboard model of a single transistor and LED, I can use a jumper to pick up whether or not I'm testing the logic for red, green, or blue. Note here that I'm only siphoning off the output for one homing switch here, which means that I don't need an OR gate to gang together the outputs of several different switches. That's why you only see two ICs being used on my breadboard. I decided that the next iteration of my wannabe Datron LED controller would be a custom strip board or kind of a mini solderable breadboard. Strip boards are slightly easier to use for me than perf boards since you can solder multiple inputs or outputs to a row, and by designing my own I could minimize the footprint. I sketched out a repeating pattern in Fusion 360 and used that sketch to guide a trace operation with a PCB engraver in Fusion 360. Again, my inner mechanical engineer is showing because I have no idea how to do circuit design using proper tools. It's something I know I'll need to learn eventually, but in this instance it was faster for me to MacGyver a strip board than it was to learn to do it the right way. Feed rate was a very conservative 12 inches per minute at 16,000 RPM and cutting to a final depth of 5,000. I also decided to pocket out the area between rows to reduce the risk of an accidental short since I didn't trust my soldering skills. For this toolpath, where the step over is not 100%, I can afford to go a little faster, so I doubled my feed rate. And, of course, you can't make a PCB without drilling some holes, so here I used a patterned drilling operation to make my through holes. I used 9 inch per minute plunges with a chip breaking cycle. You could probably go faster, I'm just lazy and I couldn't be bothered to risk breaking a tool and having to try it again. And finally, we can go to the CNC because I have been yammering on and on for far too long now. My PCB traces were deliberately designed to allow some slop. I know that even though the tip of my engraver is a 10 thou ball nose, I have to also account for a thou or two of runout. So I designed my copper features a little on the chunky side with the assumption that once they were cut they would be a little slimmer. Despite the runout, drilling also went fine. I used a 0.7mm drill bit since I wanted to make sure the through holes would be as close in diameter to my component leads as possible. My thinking was that this would make soldering easier. Unfortunately, I forgot to check all of my components and some of the header pins I used were too big for these holes and I would have to drill them out by hand later. In the end, the Shapeoko managed to mill my desired features with perfectly acceptable resolution. The only thing I had to tweak was my depth of cut since the left side of my PCB was a little bit low. I had applied my double-sided tape in patches so the outer edges of my copper board here were unsupported. Now, I didn't have everything planned out before I started assembling my LED control circuit. I knew that the middle two rows I would use as 5 volts and ground, and I also knew that my integrated circuits would be in three quadrants, with the fourth quadrant being for inputs and outputs, but for the most part I was making things up as I went along, and that came back to bite me in several instances. A lot of my wiring was inefficient because I didn't consider the logic flow. My hex inverter should have been much closer to my input headers, for example. The very first thing I needed to do with all my homing switch signals was to invert them. Having to go diagonally across my board with four leads was just dumb. I also completely forgot to consider how I would wire up my transistors. 
These don't work well on a breadboard style layout because those three legs need to each be on their own rows with the exception of ground. So I ended up having to isolate an unused part of my AND chip so I could use those rows to set up my connections to my transistors and fit the base leads onto sequential rows. The iterative process of deciding what to solder first and how to fit in subsequent components or fix dead ends took the better part of an afternoon for me. And though I wouldn't call it fun, it was actually kind of therapeutic. It's been a long time since I've found myself so invested in a task that I lose track of the world around me. These are the kinds of moments I think we all live for as makers, when you're in the zone playing whack-a-mole with problems as they come up, and despite the struggle you know you're making progress. That kind of satisfaction doesn't come from staying within your comfort zone. And after I had everything wired up as best I could, I then soldered some leads onto my LED strip and fashioned a janky connector with a row of male headers. To pull power and outputs off my carbide motion board, I used some jumper cables. It would be better if I had the proper vibration resistant connectors, but as an electronics noob, this was the best I could do. And on the workbench, everything seemed to be working, so it was time to move this to the Skeloco. To mount my circuit board on my CNC, I would need a non-conductive holder. And here, I called upon my 3D printer to make a snap-fit pocket that would secure the board, partially shield it, and give it a nice flat surface to stick onto my CNC. If I had properly accounted for and planned out my connectors, I could have made a nicer box for my circuit board, but this is admittedly just a good enough solution until I can learn to design my own PCBs with surface mount components, because then I could reduce the number of solder connections by half and the footprint to a quarter of what it is now. Within the X gantry rail, I taped on my LEDs and stuck some cable tie anchors to clean up the wiring. And the moment of truth. Blue lights at idle, check. Homing switches triggering red, check. Manually commanding spindle on for green, check. Testing it with a dummy program, confirmed. All systems are a go. But you know what really makes this all come together? Throwing a bit runner on here to automatically power on and off the router. If for some reason you live under a rock and don't know about the bit runner, I'll link to a video I made for Carbide 3D about that. It's basically a heavy duty relay triggered by G code. And that's what really gives these status lights a reason to exist, because without that level of automation, my wannabe Daytron LED controller really wouldn't feel nearly as special. I'll be honest, I went into this project with a ton of uncertainty, I hadn't done digital circuit design in years, I also didn't have a completed electrical diagram to work off of, and I thought for sure I was going to fry my carbide motion control board, which was why I was actually doing my breadboard testing on a spare controller. But in the end, this all worked out really well, and I couldn't be more pleased I challenged myself to do something so ultimately frivolous. You know what isn't frivolous, though? Starting a website with Squarespace. Squarespace gives you the tools to build a killer website fast. Not only do they make it really easy to get off the ground quickly, but they'll keep you going with built-in search engine optimization tools to keep your site growing, dedicated information security teams to keep your site safe, and of course 24-7 support to help you when you get stuck. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Winston Moy to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. I want to thank you all very much for watching. I know this wasn't exactly a practical build or heavy on the CNC skills, but sometimes I like to permit myself the freedom to do something for fun. Challenging myself to do some PCB milling and circuit design was well worth the results in my opinion. I think this is one of the coolest looking shape Okos out there, and I can't wait for you guys to see how this build will continue to evolve over time. I'll see you soon with more CNC projects and DIY nonsense.